Hello, and welcome to Dear SQL DBA, a podcast and YouTube show for SQL Server developers and database administrators. I'm Kendra Little. This week's question that we're going to cover is about locks in SQL Server and how much memory they require. This is episode number 36. Before I dive into the question, though, I want to talk a little bit about what's been going on this week at SQL Workbooks. I've been working away, and if I had to give this week a theme, the theme, the theme would be rabbit holes. <laughs> I've been working really hard on my new course on bullying execution plans in SQL Server. And I love this course. I, bullying, I kind of mean in a good way. And I use that in the course title. It sounds kind of bad, right? But it's the course is about things that can be bad or good, about using hints, about using trace flags, about kind of coercing the optimizer in SQL Server to get the performance you want, the, the benefits of it and the risks. Because you are, when we use trace flags and things like that, we're bossing the optimizer around. And one of the rabbit holes I hit is on Late on Friday afternoon, I remember distinctly thinking, I'll add one slide on trace flag 4199, which enables a bunch of optimizer hotfixes. And that one slide turned into three slides, turned into setting up a bunch of repro tests and noticing some discrepancies in the documentation and then writing some emails and asking, you know, is it supposed to do this or is it supposed to do that? And it's all good. Like all of the, we've actually had some really cool recent improvements in the ability to enable optimizer hotfixes more granularly in SQL Server 2016. We've got a new database scope option for doing this. And we don't have to use the trace flag 4199 anymore. And the, we have more ways to turn it on that in some cases with query hints require lower permissions. It's all good stuff. It just took me way longer to document <laughs> it out, especially when I started looking at 1KB and running a test and saying, I think this one word isn't right. <laughs> Don't you just love that when there's like one really important word <laughs> that you're like, I think it's supposed to be the opposite, but I have to make sure. So good stuff coming on that front. The, the week of the rabbit hole enjoyable rabbit holes, but you got to dig yourself out at some point and just get going. So let's get going on the show this week. This week's question is a really great one. It's got a lot of really interesting details in it. Here it is. Dear SQL DBA, is it possible to track the amount of memory being used for locks? Recently, we had a deployment in our dev environment where range locks were being used on a massive number of objects, and we kept getting lock timeout errors. At one point, I took a look at the sys.dmtran locks dynamic management view, and there were about 500,000 range locks. I also took a look at perfmon, and I looked at the memory manager lock memory KB counter. It only showed about 20 megabytes of memory being used. We added an additional 20 gigabytes of memory to the instance and raised the max memory for SQL Server so it could use it, and the lock timeout error disappeared. So essentially, the question is, was I using 20 gigs of memory for these 500,000 range locks? Well, first up, we're going to talk through a lot of this question and discuss it, but first, let's just do a little bit of math. One lock in SQL Server requires 96 bytes of memory. So if we have 500,000 locks, each if each of those locks uses 96 bytes, that requires 48 million bytes of memory. Now that sounds like a lot, but when we translate 48 million bytes down, what is that in megabytes? That's only 46 megabytes of memory. Now, I don't know how much memory the dev environment had before it got the additional 20 gigs of memory, but 46 megs of memory, in some perspectives, isn't too far from the perfmon sample of 20 megs. I mean, yes, it is double. 
So and if we just look at it percentage-wise, wow, that's way off. But in the scope of what's a lot of memory for a SQL server, memory is cheap these days and we need SQL Server to have a good chunk of memory for buffer pool, for execution plan cache. And, you know, 46 megs of memory is generally considered a tiny amount of memory. It's And, and the question was really like, did it need the whole 20 gigs of memory for, uh, for lock memory? And no, it looks like if it had 500,000 locks, that's about 46 megabytes of memory. But let's talk about more things that came up in this question. There were a lot of really interesting details in this question. You might wonder, hey, well, what's a lock timeout error? Like, when do I get a lock timeout error? You can set lock timeout for your session with a command. When you connect to SQL Server, you by default get a lock timeout of negative one, meaning if you are blocked, you'll wait faithfully and patiently for a lock. You're, you won't expire your lock, but you can change that. If you run a command to set lock timeout, you can set it to a specific value. If you set it to zero, it means don't wait at all. If I get blocked, just bail out and, you know, timeout. You could also set it to, you know, a thousand milliseconds. You can set it to whatever value you want it is in milliseconds. So if we're getting lock timeout errors, that implies that these sessions who are getting the lock timeouts have set their lock timeout value to something other than the default, because if it was the default, they would keep waiting patiently. You can see lock timeout sessions in SQL Server pretty easily. You may just not have thought to look for them. And if your application doesn't change its lock timeout session, you know, settings, you probably wouldn't look for them very often. For your current session, you can use at at lock timeout, you know, if it's actually, hey, what, what is my lock timeout? But you can see it for other sessions too. The dynamic management view sys.dm exec requests will show you lock timeouts for any query that's running. It's just a column in there that says lock timeout. And there's another DMV called sys.dm exec sessions where you can see a lock timeout column just for any session who's connected. Maybe they're doing something. Maybe they're sleeping and they're in a connection pool and they'll be able to be reused. So if you're listening to this and you're like, hey, I'm curious as to whether we're changing our lock timeout, check out sys.dm exec sessions and just look at who's connected and what the lock timeout column says for them. If you are a fan of using the SP who is active stored procedure, as I am, this is a free stored procedure from Adam Mechanic that you can download at whoisactive.com. It's a great way to just say, hey, what's running on my server? It doesn't show lock timeout just if you run it without any parameters. But if you wanna know, hey, for who's running on my server, what are their lock timeout settings? There's a parameter called get additional info. Get underscore additional underscore info. Set that to one. When you run SP who is active with get additional info, you'll get an additional info column with an XML little blurb in it. And if you click on that XML column and open it, it lists all sorts of these settings for that session. Like what is its Arithabort setting or ANSI null setting? And those settings actually can be very interesting and useful if you want to implement like filtered indexes or index views because a SQL Server really cares about what settings your session is using. It also shows the isolation level for this session, as well as the lock timeout. Now, of course, I should mention these are sessions, these are settings for the session. Like I could have an isolation level of read committed for my session, but I could use a hint that applies a different isolation level to one part of my query, right? So these are the session level settings of which Lock timeout is one of those settings. So you can totally see this in who's active with get additional info. Another interesting part of this question is that it's specific to range locks. This wasn't 500,000 of just any kind of lock. Range locks 
show up in a couple different places. And our questioner was looking in sys.dm trans logs or tran logs, transaction logs. There's a column in there that's request mode. And if you're looking at DMVs about locks and you see a request mode or a lock mode that says range in it, like range s dash s or range s dot u dash u or range i dash n or range x, an exclusive dash x. These locks are special. They imply that most likely serializable isolation level is in play. Now, this is one of those reasons why that get additional info, it would be awfully handy to see what the isolation level was for the session. We might need to also look at the query to see if there were hints in use. Range locks are most, range locks are used when you are using serializable isolation level. You can do this in a couple different ways, or I should say a few because it's more than two. You could say for your session, set transaction isolation level serializable. Right after you connect, you set the isolation level. You could also be using a hold lock hint or hints in your query. I, I love the name of hold lock. It's like, it sounds like, sounds like a very friendly lock. The thing about serializable is this is a very high level of isolation. And it, I don't mean high as in like <laughs> high on drugs. <laughs> It's very isolated. It's very, this is a very protective level of isolation. This is saying, I want to make sure that none of the weird things that can happen with isolation levels, none of those can happen when I'm doing my work. I won't, I don't want any phantom reads. I don't want, you know, any non-repeatable reads. Like if you go through isolation levels, there's all of these like weird little things and the more isolated you want your query to be, the more you want to make sure that your query doesn't have anything weird happening to it because of concurrent operations happening from other sessions, the more you have to protect it. And the way serializable protects the data it's accessing is to put a big old range lock around it. Now, you might, in some cases, get serializable isolation level without asking for it. So you might get range lock sometimes, even though you haven't used hold lock or set your isolation level to serializable. The main way I know to do that is if you're using cascading updates and deletes with foreign keys. If your foreign keys were created in a way that they will cascade modifications around, making changes in those tables sometimes on the back end to make sure that it properly propagates and cascade those changes, it will have to upgrade your isolation level to serializable. So if you're like, we have range locks, but we don't use serializable isolation level, it is quite likely that you're seeing those range locks due to cascading updates and deletes on your foreign keys. And I actually know quite a few folks who have tested out using cascading updates and deletes and have backed out of it because they had big problems with range locks and blocking because their system was very, very active. And they just, they needed to change the pattern where they did these updates and deletes and so that they could control exactly uh, what changed where and under what isolation level. Gotta be really careful when you're writing it yourself, but you know, blocking can be an issue too. So we have kind of like a toxic combo in this question. We've got the blockingest isolation level, which is serializable. When serializable, it, you know, because it has to, it, and it, it's, it's not doing it for bad reasons. It, it really needs to protect that range of data. So it uses these range locks and that can cause lots of blocking. And then we've also got lock timeouts set for the session. So we've got, you know, something that a setup where queries really want to block and then a setup where they're like, but I won't wait. <laughs> it's like a reality TV show for locks right there, right? It's like the real locks of SQL Server County. So that, that does, the fact that that could, could kind of explode into a bunch of lock timeouts is like, 
I don't know what the lock timeout is set to, but I'm like, yeah, that's a drama. That's a drama right there waiting to happen. So long term, like even beyond this incident, one of the things I would think of is if we do need this high level of isolation and we really need to protect our transactions, I would look at strategically, is it possible that some optimistic locking like snapshot isolation might be a fit for our application to still provide a high level of isolation, but to have less blocking because optimistic locking, there's a couple different flavors of it. There's snapshot and there's read committed snapshot. It uses a version store in TempDB so that writers don't block readers and readers don't block writers, but with snapshot isolation, I can read a consistent set of data consistent with when I begin my transaction. Got it. You know, this isn't just like a quick fix. You got to do research and make sure what isolation do we need? Exactly what does this provide? Are we going to hit race conditions in our code? Make sure it works well. But long term, that might, that might be a good fit. So worth the research. But back to the original question. It doesn't sound to me like the memory used by the lock request is like the big cause. Like it, the number of locks seen doesn't sound like it equals 26 gigs of memory. Yes, the number of locks seen does add up to more than that perf counter reported at the time you saw it sampled, but I would look at the counter for fluctuations. It's possible that they were more, the DMV, it's possible that the DMV is more in agreement with the perf counter than would appear from the two numbers we have. I would hope so. It it may well be though that, I mean, the fact that adding more memory resolved the issue does, I agree, sound like a really good indicator that it needed more memory. I mean, that's kind of a dumb thing to say, but it sounds like there's some part of the workload that did need memory and adding memory alleviated that part of the workload so that the issue went away. Like, but I don't think it was specifically that the lock requests were starving out the memory. What I would really want to know is when this is happening, what are the wait statistics on the SQL server? Who is blocking who and for how long? The fact that we've got the lock timeout errors means like so there is blocking. What is the lock timeout setting in use? What are the isolation levels in play? And are those right for the application? So those are the things that I think would help explain why adding more memory did resolve the issue, but we would want to know, hey, well, what were you waiting on? And what were all these, you know, settings involved in the lock timeout uh, errors when it happened? It's a fascinating question. I would, I would love to, um, see the SQL server when this was happening, particularly since it's in a dev environment, <laughs> right? That's the most fun, I think. So thank you for the great question. I realized recently that I, I need to make sure to thank folks for sending in these interesting questions at the end of the show. I really, I really enjoy thinking through them. And it is really fun with a question like this when you start looking at all the different parts of it. Um, the just the different topics and what you can learn from examining, you know, okay, well, what's how do we configure lock timeout and things like that? If you have a question for Dear SQL DBA, I would love to hear it. Head to sqlworkbooks.com slash ask and send me a question there. You can take free courses on how to fight blocking. I actually have a free course on how to fight blocking at sqlworkbooks.com where you can learn how to track who is blocking who and all sorts of stuff. Looking forward to answering more questions and I'll see you again next week.